and um, Michelle might be coming on too. We are here to introduce an icon, someone who is actually, who's made a huge difference, William Henry has. When, when I go through my own transformations, I, something happens and, and I, cause I'm, I'm channeling angels and painting and something happens and, and my YouTube, when I turn on, goes direct to a William Henry, a video all about what is going on for me in my ascension and how the angels, you know, how the humans would ascend during other times and become angels. And so you've had a profound effect on my art and on my work. And so I just wanted to welcome you, Michelle. I know you have a lot to say. You, you know what, Joan, I'm so glad that you jumped in and, and said that. I thought, William, you were coming on on Monday. It was on my calendar that I was supposed to <laughs> introduce you on Monday. I thought, oh, I'm off until three. And I went and had a little bite to eat with Maura. <laughs> And I just happened to come back to the space. And then I, I, I'm like, William Henry's, oh, I, I was going to text Neil just now. Anyway, <clears throat> thank you for um, jumping in, Joan. And same with me, William, you, everything Joan said, you have had such a profound impact on so many people's lives with the way that you, the way that you portray what's happening in the world today and who we are and where we're going on this ascension path. And I'm just so grateful that you're a part of Portal to Ascension and doing these conferences and doing your, your series. And I really want to dig in. What What's your topic today? I, I don't have it in front of me because I wasn't prepared, but uh, my, my, topic, my topic is what angel human hybrids wear. Ah, oh my God, I love it. Well, I have your bio. I'd like to read some of it for some of you who don't know William. He's an author, investigative mythologist, regular guest presenter on Ancient Aliens, and star of a con, oh my God, getting tongue twisted, a condom TV. William Henry is your guide into the transformative power of art and symbols of human ascension. He's been documenting humanity's awakening to its spiritual magnificence for over 20 years. Inspired by the great accomplishments of antiquity, William brings the evidence of our divinity. By bringing to life the stories of ascension through art, he teaches the secrets of soul transfiguration and, or metamorphosis and connects people to one another across cultures, time, and space. He, you, are the author of 16 books and numerous DVD programs on ancient mythology and neo-archaeology with a Stargate twist. And by applying the latest theories in science and consciousness to ancient myths of the gates of the illumined gods, including Sumerian, Egyptian, and Holy Grail gateway myths, he hopes to uncover the secrets of the guarded by such groups as the Illuminati. His latest book, Oracle of the Illumination, uh, Oracle of the Illuminati states that we are on the verge of rediscovering the sacred science of creating peace on earth. Peace on earth. Wow, very profound. You have done so much, William. We are excited to hear your presentation. So aligned with this work. I'm so glad I came back up and thank you, Joan. You are an angel. As you see, she is an angel. And William, we are, I, I just feel so blessed that you're, I'm gonna sit here and listen to every word and soak it all in. So thank you and take it away. I've missed you and Claire. Thank you, thank you so much. All right, yes, take it away. All right, thank you. Thank you, everybody. This is a, a very special day uh, always to be on Portal to Ascension, a very powerful day for me. A uh, very personally uh, powerful day. I have a dear, dear friend, Dr. Mark Gray, who's fighting for his life right now with COVID. He's been in the hospital for two weeks. He's a remarkable healer and truly a special, special person. And I'm asking at the beginning here if all of you would send us prayers, just send him breath. He, he can't breathe. And this is where literally the, the rubber reeds meets the road, as they say. This is not a uh, an easy conversation to have. It's it's one that I know many of you might have had with friends and, and loved ones. And the, the, the choices that we're making, we're all in a spiritual battle right now. That that that's how I see it. There there is a 
a, a, a dark force on this planet that is taking too many beautiful souls far too early. And I'm asking you to send all the, the highest love and light and prayers you have to, to Dr. Mark Gray at this time and feed his light body, feed his spirit. He is such a, a strong person. And the last person that you would think as a person who heals so many, you would think he would be the last person that would succumb to this terrible, terrible scourge that's on our planet right now. But um, I'm in contact with him right now um, by text and uh, I'm doing everything I can. My wife, Claire, is in constant prayer for him as are all his loved ones. And I'm asking you once again to, to join me in, in sending, sending prayers to, to Dr. Mark Gray. So thank you for, for that indulgence. And now I'm going to uh, begin my presentation and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much for, for being here. So I'm going to share the screen, find my talk. And okay, there we are. There we are. So, threads of truth and light. What angel human hybrids wear. This is an article that I wrote several years ago that I've updated for this presentation today because it's it's material, if you will, that I don't ordinarily get a chance to talk about, but I wanted to take this opportunity to, to walk through it with you today. Um, we're looking at this image here of God the creator, God the grand architect, if you will, uh, wearing a uh, an illuminated cloak enfolded in radiant angelic light with a halo bursting uh, from the top of the head. But what, what is most intriguing about this image is the way God the architect, the grand architect, is holding the compass in his hand. And that is the, the key symbol that we're going to be exploring and, and tracking through our presentation. What, what is the meaning of this compass symbolism and, and how does it relate to our, our light body our ascension body. There are very, very important keys that are enfolded within this image, as I hope you will see here as we continue. And I'm, again, hoping that these are going to be useful tools for you and uh, awareness as you continue on your own path of ascension. Here in the detail, we see the, the, the compass, we see the, the, the illuminated cloak that the grand architect is wearing. And we wonder, what, what is the meaning of this? Well, in, in my search, I I refer back to other even more ancient individuals, including Ptah, the ancient Egyptian god of technology. According to the ancient Egyptians, Ptah was the uh, architect of heaven and earth, the grand architect. Long before we had the concept of the, the grand architect in Judaism or Christianity, the Egyptians had offered Ptah as the grand architect architect of heaven and earth, master craftsman of working metal, sculptor, designer, fashioner of the bodies of men. That's the key. Because when we look at Ptah's hieroglyph, as we are looking here at the top left, we, we clearly see a double helix in his hieroglyph. Now, Egyptologists that I've pointed this out to, one, have never seen a double helix in his hieroglyph before, because to them, the ancient Egyptians knew nothing about DNA. Yet, I rebut, here is the, the God being who came from Sirius, arguably an extraterrestrial, who the ancient Egyptians said fashioned the human body. So, of course, this being knows something about DNA. And what the ancient Egyptians are saying is that Ptah didn't create the human body. He fashioned it. And the way I interpret that is that he perhaps, to use our term, tweaked our DNA. He edited it somehow. For what purpose? In my studies, I realized that, that Ptah's mission in tweaking or fashioning the human body was to make it a more conducive vehicle for our ascension. That, that is borne out in the pyramid texts, which are entirely devoted to Ptah. He is the Egyptian god of technology, if you will, but also more importantly, he's the god of ascension. The 
the step pyramid at Saqqara is, is devoted to Ptah. And there are numerous sons of Ptah who are all referred to as healers, as the therapy, excuse me, as the therapeutic, the physicians of the soul. And not only do we have a double helix in Ptah's hieroglyph, but we also have a square and we have a half circle. You can only make a half circle or a circle if you have a compass. So the compass symbolism that we looked at a moment ago in the hand of the grand architect is inferred in Ptah's hieroglyph. We have a half circle, semicircle, and we have a square. So we have a double helix, we have a square, and we have a circle with the inference being that a compass is involved. So what does all this symbolism mean? Well, let's look at the Shabaka stone, which talks about Ptah and his accomplishments. This Shabaka stone does, tells of the world's creation by Ptah and how this temple, or excuse me, how this text was copied from another text discovered at the temple of Ptah. And here's a beautiful statue that uh, was discovered in King Tutankhamun's tomb of Ptah wearing his feathered garment. It's feathered because he flies. He is the god of ascension. And that's the reason why anyone is wearing feathers, including angels in, in Judeo-Christian art. Ptah is the Egyptian creator god who existed before all other things and by his will thought the world into existence. He thought the world into existence. He conceives the world by the thought of his heart in particular and gives life through the magic of his word. This sounds like a modern day motivational seminar. We are to envision what we want in our heart, put our emotional energy to that vision, and then speak it into existence with our word, affirm that it is here now. So what we're actually talking about is Ptah is a forerunner for these modern day meditation techniques. Again, where there's something we want to visualize, we want to manifest in our life, be it right health, right livelihood, right action. We infuse that visualization with the energy of the heart, and then we speak it into existence with the word followed up by our actions. So very important messages coming through Pata as regard to manifestation, which applies to anything and everything from, as I say, wanting to change our circumstances in our earthly life and also ultimately change our, our experiences in the afterlife, especially towards manifesting our light body. As the god of craftsmen, Ptah represented the craftsman's ability to envision a finished product and shape raw materials to create that product. So here's that very valuable tool that if there's something we want to manifest, we are to visualize it fully manifested. And then feel in our heart the emotion of that fully manifested concept, idea, wish, whatever term you want to apply to it. And so, again, incredibly valuable tool that we have the ability programmed within us, I believe by Ptah, to manifest anything that we can conceive. As the, the grand architect, he is the God who fashioned our DNA to make our body a more conducive vehicle for our ascension. And assuredly, it makes sense that he would also provide the software for us to be able to do this. He tweaks the, the hardware, our DNA, and also provides us a mental uh, visualization technique to manifest that which we most desire in our life. I had an opportunity in February 2020 to visit the King Tutankhamun exhibit when it was in London and got to, for the first time in a number of years, uh, spend some face-to-face -face time with this beautiful statue of Ptah. So I just thought I'd throw that, that photo of me in there. So Ptah could be the oldest representation of an ascended being holding or representing the compass and the square. George Washington, as a Freemason, is another example, however, of an ascended being. Yes, an ascended being. George Washington did ascend, as, as, as we will discuss here momentarily. And when we look at this beautiful image of, of George Washington, we see that he has the compass and square on his 
apron. Now, some people don't like Freemasonic imagery. They have this idea that the Freemasons are somehow a, a dark force or they're a, 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 a negative force on the planet, that they have all these secrets. I, I, I defer to my, my old friend, Sir Lawrence Gardner, who said that the great secret about Freemasons is they don't know what their secrets are. Modern day Freemasons, in other words, aren't really running the world. They're not trying to run the world into the ground, as some people think. They, 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 they really don't know what their secrets are. But George Washington did know what their secrets are. And in part, it, the, the clue is not only the compass and square on his apron, but look above his left shoulder. See the ladder extending from his shoulder? See the, the letters F, H, and C, faith, hope, and charity? See the ladder extend into a rip in the fabric of space-time. The heavens are opening. There's a burst of rainbow-colored light that is welcoming George Washington once he scales or ascends this ladder. This is a, a wonderful representation of Washington in the process, actually, of ascending, in my view. And here in the detail, you see this rip in the fabric of space-time or this opening of this hole in, in heaven and Washington having ascended through the ladder now has gone through that rip in the fabric of space-time and now as we're going to see in a moment is in the ascended realms and so looking forward now we see yet another image of God the grand architect in this case it's now Jesus who holds the compass in his hand and he also holds the world in his hand and he is in the act of creating the world with this vital tool with the compass and this is aligned with the the statement in genesis god created mankind in his own image the image of god he created them male and female he created them what this means to me is that we are icons or images emanations of an artistic parent be it Ptah in the Egyptian tradition or Yahweh in the Old Testament or even, even Christ. They, we have been created in the image of God. Now, this doesn't mean that we're created in the image of a, of a Jewish God with, with dark hair and a beard, as we see in this image here. It means something else. The, the image of God is a reference to something that's internal within us, a, a far more profound idea. And as I'm going to demonstrate, especially uh, following the trail of this image here, the image of God refers to our light body. So follow me on this path here just for a moment. This is a 13th century French image of Christ now as the grand architect. You don't often see images of Christ holding tools, especially a compass. Sometimes you'll see him with a magic wand or a staff in his hand, a resurrection staff. But in this instance, he has got a compass, once again, in his hand, this tool of creation, and he is making the world. Now, when we look at the image of the world, we can see that this is not an ordinary type of world that is being created. It's symbolic of our world, and we have to figure out what is this, this symbolic world that he's creating. It will help for us to know that the compass and square are the symbol of man, you and me. More specifically, it symbolizes both our outside self and our internal self. But what exactly does this mean, our outside and our internal self? What it means is that every human being is made up of two parts. There's the part we see when we look in the mirror the external flesh and blood self, and then there is the light body self, the internal self that we don't see when we look in the mirror. It's ever present. It's always there. And what the ancient mystery schools tell us is that it is actually that divine light body within us that manifests the physical body. Our physical body is made in the image of this light body. And that's the part that we don't see. The part you see is your physical body, but the part you don't see is your soul, which is your light body. The square in the compass and square symbolism represents your body. 
that's the part you see. The square in all sacred geometry traditions represents the earth. It symbolizes the four elements that our body is made of, earth, air, fire, and water. It also symbolizes the, the four winds or the four directions of earth. Today, there is a group of, in my opinion, very dark souls on this planet that seek to tell us that we're actually now want to make a, a replacement body for ourselves that is made of four elements, not earth, air, fire, and water. Rather, they want us to make a new body made of bits, atoms, neurons, and genes, or AI, neuroscience, nanotechnology, and genetic technology. I'm not going to go into detail about that. I've I've done present, lengthy presentations about this elsewhere, including here on Portal to Ascension, which you can seek out on my talks about transhumanism. But the fact is, is that they are trying to create a mock version, a fake version of our body utilizing these man-made technologies of bits, atoms, neurons, and genes. We have to then look to our soul. And that's the importance of following the symbolism of the compass, because the compass symbolizes the soul, the part you don't see when you look in the mirror. You see your soul in your daily actions. If you want to know the state of your soul, look at your daily actions. And that's how you know where your soul is at. If you're if your actions are, are righteous, and true, your soul's in good shape. If your actions aren't aligned with righteousness and truth, those are areas you want to put light into. You want to be getting this process of aligning your soul with your, your highest spiritual potentials of, of righteousness, truth, and highest love possible. When placed together, the compass and the square is designed to teach us that we're more than just the body the part we see. And most of us are aware of that. If you're listening to this presentation, you know there is more to you than just your body. Deep down underneath it all, you know you are an eternal soul temporarily inhabiting this realm and that your body is a manifestation of the soul. And you manifested this body to be an agent of our creator, to be an agent of love and light and to assist others on this path. What we're actually looking at in this image, what I have identified it as anyway, is a fractal, a, a fractal that's specifically re referred to as the Mandelbrot set. A fractal is a natural phenomena or a mathematical set that exhibits a repeating pattern that displays the same details at every scale. And the message here is that we are a fractal of our creator. We are made in the image of God, which means we have, we are fractals of God. We have the God force within us, and God sent us here on God's behalf. Many of you I know have seen the Mandelbrot set, this very famous fractal that we're looking at here, that was first discovered in, in the 1970s by Benoit Mandelbrot, who is a mathematician working with the newly invented personal computer. And he puts in this mathematical code and out comes this astounding graphic referred to as the Mandelbrot set. And at every level of magnification, the Mandelbrot set shows exactly the same repeating pattern. And it's just one of the great synchronicities in all of sacred art that I've ever seen that the image that Christ is, is creating with the compass matches precisely the Mandelbrot set. How could that be possible? This is a 13th century French image and the Mandelbrot set wasn't discovered until the invention of the personal computer in, in the 1980s. But yet here it is. It, it's very clear that that's what, what's going on here. Well, as this story continues, and here you see the, the A to B or side-by-side -side comparison of the fractal that Christ is fashioning with his compass and the Mandelbrot set. What mathematicians did once they, they saw this Mandelbrot set for the first time, and it was really quite a mind-blowing experience for them, is that one clever mathematician noticed that the Mandelbrot set bears a striking resemblance to a meditating Buddha. So knowing that if a programmer looks at the Mandelbrot set and wants to change some tiny detail, maybe make some of the bumps go away, they can't do it without going back to the original equation and changing it. 
This is the fallacy of transhumanism and AI. The, the big tech swingers in Silicon Valley and the people they work for in Beijing or, or wherever their bosses are, think that they can augment the human body. They can inject it with things. They can augment it with chips. They can replace all our organs. And they think that somehow they're creating a, a, a better version of humanity. Not according to the Mandelbrot set philosophy. In order to, to transform the human body, we have to go back all the way to the beginning, to the original equation and start anew. If, we, if they do that, they change everything. We have to tear down the universe and build another one from scratch. We can't just start adding new appendages to the body. You know, like for example, they think, what would a human be like with three arms or uh, three physical biological eyes? Or what would it be like if, as Elon Musk wants to do? The sprinkle the neocortex with his nano chips so that you can have an IQ of 10,000. What's that going to do for you? I mean, really, come on. We have to respect that we are created by God for a specific purpose. And these big tech swingers, of course, are godless atheists. So they don't really agree with me in my, in my contention that we have to leave the human body the way it is and utilize its natural organic capabilities. If we want to augment the body, we can do so by tapping the inexhaustible capabilities of the light body, not by imposing or forcing uh, from without the will of tiny minded men, okay? Within the Mandelbrot set, we see the richness of our unity and also the richness of our individuality. We are baby Mandelbrot sets, if you will. We are fractals of our creator. As I said a moment ago, one of the, the clever mathematicians who is working with Benoit Mandelbrot noticed that the Mandelbrot set, and I'll go back one slide, resembled to them a meditating Buddha. And so what they did is they went back and altered the original mathematical equation that produced the Mandelbrot set, and they came up with what they call the Buddha Brot. So here I'm going to show you a Mandelbrot set superimposed over a meditating white Tara, who we're looking at here. So here we go, now putting the Mandelbrot set on top of it, and it's a perfect match once again. And this, again, is what inspired these mathematicians to alter the equation, and they came up with what is called the Buddha Brot. And here is the Buddha Brot, which is a fractal rendering technique related to the Mandelbrot set that uh, reflects in its name, the Buddha brought, reflects its uncanny resemblance to classical depictions of the meditating Buddha. Now, here's the thing. When I looked at this Buddha brought, I thought, wait a minute, this looks strikingly similar, perhaps even identical to Tibetan images of the rainbow light body which is what we see here uh, side by side now with the Buddha bra. The, 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 the image on the left is of Padmasambhava, who is a high celestial being who materialized on earth in order to teach the rainbow light body to the Tibetans and also people around the world in, in various traditions. We can see that it's a humanoid form that is in a rainbow light body that again, perfectly matches the, the rainbow coloration of the Buddha brought and also the shape of the meditating Buddha. And this got me really excited when I made this connection because once again, this is a visual representation of our true self. You wanna know what your soul looks like, you're looking at it. Our true self is the rainbow light body. And it's covered over by false perceptions. It's covered over by literally by our flesh and blood body. The, the rainbow light body, our true self, isn't something that we go out and manifest. It's something that we reveal. It's our true divine nature. It, it is, in my view, the, the building block of our, of our physical body. It's what manifests the physical body. And the physical body has the ability to phase back into its original divine nature through pure thought, through will, just like Ptah taught. 
So with this, we're, we're provided a visualization of our true self. We are, we are looking at images of Padmasambhava, but we're actually looking at a representation of our soul and who we are as spiritual beings. And the object of, of our spiritual quest is to align ourselves with the divine nature of the rainbow light body. One way we do that, according to Tibetan Buddhism, is, by, is through contemplation, meditation, and reflection on the images of Padmasambhava in his light body. Because he's a, an avatar being, he has the ability to transmit the frequency or vibration of the rainbow light body through the image that we are seeing here. So right now you're making eye-to-eye, soul-to-soul contact with Padmasambhava in his rainbow light body, and it is activating your own rainbow light body. Something I noticed is that the way the Tibetans portray Padmasambhava matches the way the ancient Egyptians portrayed Ptah. The, the, the stairway behind him is called the Jed pillar, the power pillar, a resurrection pillar. It's rainbow colored. He wears a rainbow ring around his neck. The symbolism matches because they are in the same state of being. The name Pata and Padma are phonetically interchangeable. Some even believe that Padmasambhava and Pata are the same reincarnating figure. And I, I would agree with that, that possibility. Of course, the rainbow light body is the same as the resurrection body in Christianity. This is why you see in Christianity, images of the enthroned Christ resurrected, sitting on a throne, holding his resurrection stick with the rainbow rings around his body. It's because he's in his rainbow light body. And in fact, Jesus taught this symmetrical idea, the fractal ideal, that we are fractals or holograms of our creator when he said, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Verily, very truly, I tell you, Jesus said, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater thing than, things than these because I am going to the Father. What this means is that we are fractals of our creator. We have the same capabilities, the same physical body that Jesus had. We can do the same things that Jesus could do in terms of performing miracles because the Father, that ability is within us. As I said a moment ago, I believe that it was Ptah who fashioned our human body to be able to manifest this light body and also to perform these superhuman feats of, of healing and manifestation. So here we're seeing the correspondence between the resurrected Christ on the rainbow and Padmasambhava. For Christians, our physical body is a step towards the perfect body and a perfect soul. This is important because the Tibetan rainbow light body tradition is also referred to as the great perfection, with the word perfection meaning to become more whole, more holy, more complete. Paul told us that our physical body is a step towards that perfect body. The Tibetans tell us that it's already within us. So the steps that we're taking towards the light body are steps towards our true self. It's not that we're going out here and looking for something. Our title of our talk is what angel human hybrids wear, threads of truth and light. Those threads are, are within us. It's a revealing process that we're all undergoing. Every moment of our lives is a, is a choice point to reflect our true self, to acknowledge our true self and to live from the perspective that we are these illuminated Christ-like beings. Paul says there's a physical body and a different spiritual body in which we will be resurrected. And I can go along with that, so long as we know that that resurrected body is already within us. And as Paul says, for you were once in darkness, but now light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, says Paul in Ephesians. What we need to do is connect to our future angelic self, our original self, as we walk in light. And as we do that, we will be wearing the cloak of, or garment of light that Christ is portrayed here wearing, that Padmasambhava is portrayed wearing, and also all the other spiritual masters wear. 
it is our true self. In the Gospel of Philip, this is affirmed, where Jesus is, where we said about Jesus that the Lord rose from the dead. He became as he was, but now his body was perfect, meaning whole, holy, and complete. He possessed flesh, but this was true flesh. Our flesh isn't true. Ours is only an image of the true. It's a fractal of the true. Our true self, the true you, the true me, is this divine light being that inhabits and animates our physical body. It's within awaiting that revealing, and we reveal it by walking in love, light, and truth. Because humans are made in the perfect image of God, because we are fractals of God, we have the spiritual capacity to participate in or mirror Jesus's divine glory as image bearers and reactivate or reveal our light bodies. Once again, the Bible is specific, as was the man of dust or DNA, carbon, our physical bodies, so also are those of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, our flesh and blood bodies, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. And the reason why this is a spiritual truth is because that image of the man of heaven or woman is already within us. It is already there. And we've covered it up with false perceptions, negative perceptions, and we have to reveal it for ourselves. One way that we reveal it is by mirroring what we see in these images. Many of you will be familiar with my work on the sacred art of ascension and documenting the neuroscience of sacred art. That says that as you are looking at this image of Christ bursting into light, your mirror neurons in your neocortex are firing as if you are bursting into radiant rainbow colored light. But we have an editor that says, uh, chill out, William. You gotta get through this presentation. You don't just burst into light at this moment. Maybe wait till after dinner. Ha ha ha, just being facetious. But literally, there's an editor that says, oh, hold on. Uh, don't kickstart the automatic process, the spontaneous process within our DNA, put there by Ptah, according to the ancient Egyptians, that enables us to unfold or reveal our true spiritual self. So sacred art is that key that can awaken it. One good example of that art is in the, the dome of the US Capitol. And I included this in honor of Dr. Mark Gray, my, my friend mentioned earlier. He and I were the first to decode the ascension symbolism in the dome of the US Capitol. For several years, we were running back and forth into the Capitol and, and looking at this symbolism. It started with a conversation. I was giving a presentation that Mark attended. And I said, look at this image. We're looking up into the dome of the U.S. Capitol, which so many fucking assholes think is some kind of a horrible place. And excuse my language, but I'm really upset by what has happened to our government in these past few months and the way they are treating the souls of this planet as if we are just garbage. OK, the keys to our ascension are in that dome. And it was off limits to every single American for months because we have a political force on this planet that is so dark and so demonic that they wanna control every facet of your life. They wanna mandate what is possible for you and they wanna force you to see and do things the way their dark and demonic rulers want things to be done on this planet. And it's up to us if we ever want to see freedom on this planet to once again take control of this dome and the powerful symbolism that is encoded within. And what do we see within? We see George Washington, the founding father of this country, who is not some racist contrivance like you see these, whoever these people are, I don't even know what, what, what to call these people that want to argue that America is some kind of racist institution or some bullshit like that. It's just complete nonsense. What America is, is a physical space and a psychological space where souls were and still are free to attain their ultimate ascension. And George Washington is presented as the exemplar of this, leading the way. The reason he's on a rainbow is because he is an ascended being and he is equal to 
in this mindset, all the ascended beings, including Christ, who have attained their rainbow light body, because we're made in the perfect image of God, we have the spiritual capacity to participate in or mirror Jesus's divine glory as image bearers. And we must uphold this spiritual truth and the truth of America that that is still possible for all of us while there is still time. We have to shut down these dark and demonic forces that seek to take God out of this country, out of your vocabulary, out of your soul, and replace it with some who knows what kind of force. I mean, it's getting so bizarre the, the way these people are coming across and the freedoms they're trying to take away from us and what they're trying to force on us. And the only way through this nightmare scenario that they are creating, in my opinion, is to activate the image of God from within and to begin to live from this perspective and awaken people to that power that we have within. And this is the, the crux of it. It's because these political forces seek to take that power away. They know how important this moment in time is and that if they can begin to force and mandate technologies on the human body, that it will forever cripple our ability to ultimately attain this light body. That is what is at stake right now. And each of us are compelled at this moment to decide which side for eternity do we want to be on. The dark and demonic side that wants to force, mandate this technology on the human body in order to subjugate the soul and eliminate the soul. I'm talking about you, Facebook. I'm talking about Google. I'm talking about all the big tech swingers that seek to control the human spirit because they don't even believe in the soul. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in the human spiritual potential. All they want to do is mandate. All they want to do is force. All they want to do is censor anything that has to do with true spiritual freedom. You and I are the wall. We are what stands in between free humans from now on or enslaved humans. And again, what we are discussing at this very moment is the key to our freedom. In order to, to more fully understand this, I want to take you back into ancient history, because as we look into the ancient world, we find out that the symbolism of the compass and the square did not originate, perhaps in Egypt. It's certainly not Freemasonic, and it, it, it's ultimately far ancient, more ancient than many of us realize, and is likely coming from a source even beyond the earth. We're looking, looking here at Chinese paintings of Nuwa and Fuxi a brother and sister uh, creator gods who hold in their hands the tools of creation. The miraculous creation of humanity from clay or DNA is a theme that appears in numerous religious traditions, including the ancient Chinese. And the key to it is this symbol of the compass and the square. These two figures are always depicted holding these same symbols in their hands, which has been, which have been described by many scholars as the tools of creation and divine order. So if we want to know how to bring divine order back into our world. These tools, the compass and the square, actually inform us how to do this. Since antiquity, the square has represented, as I said, the physical body. The circle, on the other hand, has always represented the soul. And it is the unity of the soul and the body working in harmony together that symbolizes man's state as an eternal soul manifesting in a temporary body. We have the forces of light and dark. A moment ago, I'm, I'm railing against these dark forces because I'm really upset at what they have unleashed on this planet. But deep down, I recognize that we must harmonize them. We may not be able to destroy them, and we shouldn't seek to destroy them. Nancy Pelosi, all these other people, we don't want to destroy them. What we want to do is illuminate them, harmonize them with the light. That is the only way forward. We, we, we have to be able to find it in our hearts to express love to these dark forces that seek to subjugate 
to control, to mandate, to force, to ultimately control. Those are horrible words. We have to replace that with words like illumination, transcendence, and, and that is the great battle of our times. And that battle is going on within each of us. It's going on within me, it's going on within you. And the image of the, the yin yang symbol is a representation of that harmony. There's always a third force that's involved and that's what we've also, also got to begin to tap into as well. These symbols, the compass and the square, represent the original perfect teaching of the celestial beings. I know many of us are trying to call in higher celestial beings at this time, our higher forces, our higher angels that can transmute our present situation. We recognize that thinking like a human at this time is going to only get more human results. We have got to raise our ascension intelligence. I have long maintained that the antidote to artificial intelligence and these artificial manipulations, this augmentation that is taking place is to tap into our ascension intelligence. We have to think like the angels. And this is uh, the, the key to it here because the compass in the square represents the, the, the creation tools of the angels. They symbolize the craft of the gods who use them in the formations of our bodies and our reality. They represent the cosmos and the means to harmonize with it. They represent the yin yang male female duality within us, the dark light and forces playing out in our world today. The compass makes the circle and is feminine. The square of course then is masculine, masculine. And when we harmonize these two twisting serpents or currents within us, we achieve at one moment or atonement with all that is. Every form can re be reduced in its, to its permanent constituents, which are just straight lines and circles. And this is why we see the angels and we see the ascended beings carrying or bringing the compass and square to our awareness. I want to take you to Ravenna, Italy, to uh, the Basilica of San Vitale. We're, we're looking here at a image of the resurrected Christ on the blue orb. Up above on the ceiling, we see a, a, a provocative scene in which we see four angels on blue orbs as well, surrounding a lamb in a circle filled with stars or perhaps a stargate. Why am I showing this to you? Well, the, the reason is, is because when we come into the detail here, we see that the angels are all wearing linen garments, white linen garments, symbolizing purity. The linen garments also symbolizing the light body garments that they wear. And on those garments, we see a symbol. We see the symbol of the square. We see the symbol of the square, the L-shaped symbol. What does that ultimately mean? What is the, the hidden meaning? Why are these angels uh, portrayed with the L or the square on their garment? When I first saw this, I thought, well, this is a, this is a pun because these beings are called the Ls or shining ones. So put an L on their, on their garment and it represents that they are the Ls, the Elohim, the shining ones. And, and here we see in the detail the, the Lamb of God in the uh, circle of stars, or what I would call the Stargate. But there's there's more to this than, than just the pun. And that's the journey we're, we're taking at this moment into this symbolism. As we continue uh, looking at the, the imagery that we see in San Vitale, we see once again, Christ on the blue orb. We see the angels on either side, and we see that these angels, once again, have the L shape, the L symbol on their cloak or their garment. They are the Ls, the shining ones. The, the angels of the Lord is another term for these beings. These are the angels of the Lord dressed in white garments that appeared in the tomb on Easter morning, along with Mary Magdalene. She saw these beings. She encountered them. She interacted with these beings, the angels of the Lord. And they possess the ultimate secrets that we seek today to be able to transmute or transfigure our world. 
So once again, we see the angels in the detail with the L on their garment. What does it represent? Where is this leading us? We know it represents the square, and we know that this is one of the tools of creation, but there's even more to it than that. And that's where we're headed in this investigation. And in order to, to fully uh, reveal the ultimate meaning of this symbolism, we go to St. Apollinari Nuevo, which is also in Ravenna, Italy. This is another uh, basilica built at the same time as San Vitale around 400, 500 AD, which means it's very close to original Christianity, to pure Christianity. Today's Christianity bears very little resemblance to the original Christianity practiced by the first Christians. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> the first Christians who were largely Jewish Buddhist mystics known as the Essenes. But here we see a, a very interesting scene now where we've got the three magi uh, approaching the Christ child on the bottom. And up above, we have the apostles all holding scripts or books, books of knowledge, the book of love, perhaps, with L's on their garments, the same L's that we saw the angels wearing. So what this means is that these first apostles who once again are the Jewish Buddhist mystics, the Essenes, know the innermost meaning of the L or this, this symbolism. And so here in the detail, we see the apostle with the L, uh, he's standing above the three magi, the Zoroastrian or Persian magi, who also know the ultimate secrets of illumination. They're coming to greet the Christ child who is a magi even greater than them the high celestial being that the Essenes had called in. And we see him now as we go forward on the lap of the Virgin Mary, who is enthroned on her jewel throne. The, angel, the angels of the Lord are on either side of this jewel throne. Christ is on her lap. The angels in Christ all have the L on their garment, telling us that they are aligned with this teaching. They are all part of the, the angels of the Lord, the shining ones, the, the magi who know the innermost secrets of the celestial beings who were represented in, this, in these beautiful mosaics. So it's very important that they keep repeating this L imagery in these scenes. And it suggests to me that this represents the innermost secret of original Christianity. Now here we see also at Apollo Nuevo, the, the, Christ is now enthroned. He's no longer a child. He's a fully adult male. His face matches that that we see on the Shroud of Turin. And we see again, the L's, the illuminated beings, the celestial beings on either side, some of them giving us the blessing mudras, but all of them have the L symbolism on their garment. So what does it mean? We're coming very close now to the, the, what I believe is the ultimate answer for this symbolism. We started out asking, what do angel-human hybrids wear? Well, they wear light body garments, as with these apostles here. They wear light body garments with that letter, what we call the letter L, etched onto their garment. And here is, in my opinion, what the L ultimately represents. And the this is very profound uh, symbolism in, in my view. What it represents is the Shroud of Turin. And what the Shroud of Turin is, is the burial shroud of Christ. There is so much science that now has verified and validated that this linen shroud is in fact the burial shroud of Christ. We have the, the proper dating now, not the fake carbon dating, that, that misled so many people into believing it was a forgery from the 13th or 14th or 15th century, or at some point that it's some kind of uh, object of art. It's not an object of art. It is a, it is a relic. It is an, actually, as, the, as Pope Francis adroitly called it, an icon of love. An icon in Christian speak is a two-way mirror. It's a communications channel. It's an image that can put you into contact with a higher divine being, in this case, Christ. So what's the connection 
between the Shroud of Turin and the L that we see on the garments of the angels and the original apostles. The connection is, is that there's three, excuse me, there are four holes in the Shroud of Turin that are referred to as poker holes. The, the, the Shroud uh, suffered a, 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 a minor destruction or not a destruction, but uh, it, uh, it, it was damaged during a fire. And some scholars say that these three poker holes were caused when they, they tried to rescue the shroud from that fire. But I'm of the opinion that that is not the, the, the source of these holes, that this is perhaps an intentional thing where we see these L-shaped poker holes in this peculiar L shape. I believe it's a signal to the viewer, but for what purpose? The ultimate purpose is to reveal that the first apostles knew the secrets of the Shroud of Turin. They knew the secret of the transmutation into a being of light that Christ affected during his resurrection. And they knew that the Shroud of Turin was an icon or a relic of that event. And as an icon, they knew that the shroud could transmit to them the frequencies or the vibration of the resurrected Christ. I have been in front of, face-to-face -face in front of the Shroud of Turin on two occasions. In both cases, my wife Claire was with me. And in both instances, we both had profound energetic experiences. A transference occurred as we were meditating in front of the Shroud of Turin in the Cathedral of John the Baptist in Turin, Italy. We know that power. The Knights Templar knew that power. The Knights Templar wore linen uh, strands around their waist that had been charged on an image that is, in fact, the Shroud of Turin, because they knew that the Shroud could emit or transmit to them the vibration of the resurrected Christ. The rank and file Templars were told to wear this linen uh, linen strand as a force of protection in their earthly life, but also as a guarantee for safe passage into the afterlife. What I'm saying to you is that as an icon, the shroud is capable of transmitting that vibration to us. And that is what that L represents on the garments of the, the angels of light and also on the, the garments of the angels. Now, this L symbolism also appears in an extraordinary way in this vital icon created by Leonardo da Vinci of Salvatore Mundi, the savior of the world, in which Christ is offering us a blessing and in which he holds in his hand an orb of light. Now, when I look at this orb of light, when I first looked at it, and my wife Claire and I discussed this in our Gaia program, Arcanum, and we're on record in this conversation about this remarkable painting with all these Leonardo da Vinci aficionados and experts. They, they argued that this can't be an original Leonardo painting because he never would have made the mistake of showing the, the, uh, the, the obscured image of the hand through the orb of light, the crystal, the crystal and ball in his hand that this is a, an example of an amateur's painting of, of an orb of light. And Leonardo being an expert in optics would not have made this mistake. When I looked at that, what I saw was not three, three dots that represent a mistake by Leonardo, but rather an intention. Those three dots symbolize the Chintamani stone of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, the wish-fulfilling gem that can manifest the rainbow light body. And that is what I believe those triple dots represent. But furthermore, can you also see the L shape in these triple dots? Not only do we have the three dots, but Leonardo has also portrayed them in an L shape. That is by intention in my view. He is aligning this image of Salvatore Mundi with all the other L images. Look at this image here. This is an icon, one of the, in fact, the earliest icon of Christ. It was found at St. Catherine's Monastery 
in the Sinai in 1962, it was painted or created, manifested in the fourth century or early fifth century AD. The face perfectly matches that of the Shroud of Turin, which automatically tells us that the Shroud of Turin couldn't have been a 13th century forgery. How could this painter, this icon painter, have created the precise face on the Shroud of Turin unless he had seen the Shroud of Turin or had a vision of the being represented in the Shroud, which is Christ, and in the fourth or, or early fifth century? So validation that the Shroud is real. But look at the book in Jesus's hand. He has the triple dot symbol in his hand, the same triple dot symbol found on Salvatore Monday that represents the Holy Spirit in Christianity, but also the Chintamani or Chintamani stone in Tibetan Buddhism. But what else do you see on that book? Do you see the L shapes? I hope so, because those are also placed there intentionally. They're aligning us with this imagery. And here is a, the side-by-side -side comparison of Salvatore Mundi holding the, the orb of light with the Buddhist Bodhisattva holding the Chintamani. In, in Tibetan Buddhism, the Chintamani stone is called the wish-fulfilling gem, and it produces or manifests the rainbow light body, the resurrection body. And this is why Christ is portrayed holding that orb. And in this icon, what is actually happening is that Christ is offering that power to you. He is saying, as an icon of the creator, created by artistic parents, you have this ability within you to activate these latent Christ-like abilities. And if you don't like talking about Christ or Christianity or Christ-like abilities, then perhaps you'll, you'll follow the path of the bodhisattvas and recognize that within us is a pure being referred to as a bodhisattva by the Tibetan Buddhists who have come to earth, stayed on the earth plane to assist all other souls in their own ascension. And in the bodhisattva vow, they, re, they will stay on earth until all souls have ascended and then they will complete their own ascension. But for our purposes, the point I'm making is that the orb of light in the hand of Salvatore Monday is exactly the same as the orb of light in the hand of the Bodhisattva that we see here. It represents this high spiritual ability that we all have to manifest our, our light body. Now, I, I scour ancient images for ancient artwork for images of ascended beings that can guide our ascension. To me, perhaps one of the top three images of all human history, artistic history of these ascended beings is, is this image here of the Amitabha Buddha of infinite light. What the Buddhists teach about this image is that the Amitabha Buddha is shown descending on a cloud from the pure land. He is descending to meet and greet a pure soul and to take that pure soul back to the pure land with him to assist the pure soul in completing its ascension. The key is the Buddhists teach that all one has to do is hang this painting near the bedside of a being in the moment of transition tie a silken thread to it, and that the transitioning soul, when it leaves its body, can grab a hold of that silken thread and ascend or cross over to the pure land through this painting. Now, if that doesn't blow your mind, I, 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 I'm, I'm out of bullets. I, I, I can't think of anything more mind-blowing or hopeful than the idea that the Amitabha Buddha of infinite light as an ascended being, as an avatar, an ascended master, if you will, can, Five more minutes, trans William. can transmit the vibration of our ascended body through a painting and that a soul can journey with him to the pure land through the painting. I explain this through quantum entanglement. And in fact, 
the symbol of quantum entanglement is shown on this drum that we see here. But look in the lower right of our painting. Can you see the Bodhisattva there in the lower right? She or he has a uh, resurrection stick in his hand and dangling from that resurrection stick is what? Our L shape. That's profound because it shows that this symbolism of the L shape is known to the Tibetan Buddhism. If we look into the Book of Kells, which was some people believe uh, created in Ireland by or under the influence of Buddhist monks, we see profound symbolism. We William, see wheels within wheels. William, just want you to know we're going to, uh, you have about four more minutes. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll be wrapping up here in less than four minutes. We see the wheels within wheels, and we also see the L shape once again. The L shape is the compass, or excuse me, it is the square, and the circles that we see are represented by the compass. Since these similar motifs and symbols seem to show up in disparate cultures and places, the only way that some groups could have had them is by revelation from a common source. And, and that is the ultimate message here. And I'm gonna leave you with the one final message that's also found in this remarkable image from the Book of Kells. If you look at the wheels within wheels, you see that they are not the yin yang symbol. On the right hand side, you see that they are actually what's referred to by the Tibetans as the wheel of joy the, with the three rays instead of the two of the yin yang symbol. What this means is that the Book of Kells, whoever created the Book of Kells, must have known about the Wheel of Joy and its connection to the rainbow light body. My ultimate message here for you is that our world is a world of duality, light and dark, male and female. But the only way to transcend that duality is to find that third and higher way. We have got to use everything that we know of this symbolism, the compass and the square, to look for that third way. And I hope that my presentation has been provided some insight, maybe some inspiration for you to help us all at this moment to escape uh, the, the force of, of darkness on this planet, not just by resisting it, but by transmuting it with a higher and fire, finer bright vibration. And it's up to us to, to find a way to draw that higher, finer vibration into our world and to once and for all, enable all souls and count in, in souling on this planet to be able to escape the, the, the fate of darkness that is awaiting if we choose to do nothing. The choice is ours, the moment is now, and I support you in any way possible to be able to find a way to transcend this duality, to bring in this higher, finer light. So thank you all very much for, for joining me today. Thank you to Portal of Ascension for uh, offering this opportunity. And I look forward to interacting with you on down the road in a time of greater light and love than any of us can conceive. So thank you very, very much. Thank so, you. so well said, William. How do people find you? My website is williamhenry.net and all my contact information is available on my website. Again, williamhenry.net. I hope you read the chat. I hope you're able to see what people were chatting in, William, because you, everybody is so wowed by what you shared with the beautiful and profound Im imagery that gave us all transmissions today. And I just want to thank you for your passion and your dedication. Thank you. To get this information out. You, you're you a true hero. <laughs> thank you. That's so kind of you. And we're all heroes. We're, we're all in this together. We are. And we're, we're linking hearts and minds and know what we have to do. And now it's time to do it. Thank you for giving us these tools. My You're, pleasure. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. All Everybody. right. Thank, Thank you so away, much. Michelle. Thank you Bye -bye. so much, William. You were fantastic. Hi, William. Give Claire a hug from me, please. I sure will. Okay. God bless all. Thank you. God bless you. Wow.